All right, there we go. Okay, so let's look at, uh, hi Harley. Uh, we're looking at some problems here. I'm not sure what your question is quite yet, uh, Tracy, but I'll address this. Uh, this negative and the x squared over two, we would want to rewrite that as negative one half times x squared. So we found my question, and that's why I did probably. Might have should. Yep, that's the proper way to uh, to rewrite that. There's there's a couple different rewriting tips on these things, and if we rewrite the negative x squared divided by two as negative one half times x squared, then that looks like a case of the scalar multiple property we can handle. So um, uh, there's a couple different ways that we talked about writing the derivative. One of them was dy over dx, right? There is another way equal to it, and that is you can say y prime. Okay, I don't know if I said that. Um, other other ways were uh, f prime of x. Um, a third way sometimes you can see is let's say the derivative with respect to x of f of x equals. So all of uh, those are your standard four. F prime d over dx, and then you, here you put f of x, dy over dx, and then y prime. So yeah, that might be something you want to add on to another problem. On this particular problem, and this is great, uh, this says find the derivative, and then at the given value, okay? And so what we're going to do to find the derivative at a given value is step one, find the derivative Step two, substitute in the given value. Like a lot of things, order is very important here. Okay? We're going to do it the right way, and then I'll show you what happens if you do it the wrong way. Okay? So, first let us find the derivative. It's a good sort of warm up for a Monday. Uh, we've, we've rewritten it so that we have a multiple out here. So, remember your uh, power rule? Pop down. So, I'll pop down the two. Two times the negative one half is. Mm -hmm. negative, one. negative one. So negative one times x, then we'll power down, so that means turn, uh, decrease this exponent by one, so d turns into a one. I'm not even going to bother about, I'll write it there because I think it's too long to turn around. Negative two x, now remember that this x has an invisible one exponent there, so this would be one times the negative two, which is still negative two, and then x to the zero, right? And yeah, we know that's one. I'll simplify here in the next step. And then minus four. Uh, what's the derivative of zero? Minus four, yeah, so zero. So I put minus zero for one. And then we'll go ahead and uh, y prime equals, so negative x. And then x to the zero is, what did you say? One. One, that's right. So that turns to one. So that's just negative two. So y prime is negative x minus two. That's step one. That's the derivative. Step two, at the given value. So they tell us, find the derivative at x equals negative two. So uh, I might write this as y prime evaluated at negative two, sort of kind of quasi-function notation just to kind of remind myself what's going on here. So putting the negative two in the inside and plugging in negative two for the x. So negative, negative two, minus two. So that's gonna be four minus two, which is two. y prime evaluated at negative two is two. We've answered the question. That's a good answer. Let's just do a little bit of review real quick. What does this mean? What does this two mean? Wouldn't Simon? it be zero? Wouldn't it be zero? Yeah. Probably zero. Yeah, sorry. Oh man, that cat ruins my out of order speech. Okay. Thanks, yeah, two minus two is zero, not two. Okay, what does this mean? And then we'll talk about the other stuff a little bit. We could just look at uh, x equals negative two. Okay. So the slope of the here. tangent. Okay. The slope of the tangent line. To the function. At x equals negative two is zero. zero, that's right. That's what this means. The derivative, at, at, 
derivative at evaluated at negative t was zero means the slope of the tangent line test x x equals negative t is zero. Now, further this a little bit. What does a zero slope mean? It is the, the slope is horizontal, or the, the line is horizontal. Okay, this pushes us a little bit into chapter three. But there's a uh, horizontal slope occurs at actually one of two very special spots. Yeah, it occurs when you've got that sort of situation where it's a peak or a trough. Uh, in a few chapters, we'll talk about that. That this is what's called a relative maximum, and this is a relative minimum. And they, that occurs where you get the slope of zero, or slope of the tangent line is zero, because you know as you can tell these slopes are positive over here; these slopes are negative, and so therefore that the tipping point, literally, is when the slope is zero, when things go from positive slope to negative slope, or in this case, from negative slope to positive slope. Okay. Well, that didn't. That's not going to help. Well, my next question. Um, let's modify this slightly. Instead of saying that x equals negative 2, let's say x equals positive 2. Okay? So now I'm going to go back to showing you why we have to do find the derivative and then evaluate it. So, uh, y prime evaluated at positive 2 is negative 2 minus 2, which is negative 4. Negative 4, okay. Which means the slope of the tangent line to f of x at, negative, at positive 2 is negative 4. Okay, great. We all understand that, right? Okay, that's good. Now, that's a good answer. What if we had done these steps in the wrong order? What if we had evaluated it and then found the derivative? Let's see what happens. So what if I plug in 2 into this initially? I would get y equals uh, negative, oh my gosh, I took the wrong sign here. Negative 2 squared divided by 2 minus 2 times 2 minus 4. So, so I get negative 2 minus, oh, minus 4, right? Minus 4. So do we get negative 10? So if you evaluate it at the point, then you get negative 10. And then you take the derivative y prime would equal zero. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing. If you do that, if you do it this way, you're going to get zero every single time. Because if you're you, always have a constant. because you're always going to have a constant, that's right. And then you take a derivative of a constant, then you get zero. What's more, it doesn't make sense to evaluate, to find the derivative at, uh, at what? That, that's not the case. This is the y value. This isn't the function. You take the derivative of a function, okay? So anyway, uh, just don't make that mistake. If they say find the derivative, evaluate at that point, then follow those instructions in the proper order. Find the derivative, then evaluate at that point. Okay. Now there were a couple other weird ones. This notation says F apostrophe, 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 which means third derivative, yeah. Take the derivative, then take the derivative of that, which would be the second derivative, and the derivative of that would be the third derivative. Okay, sneaky way of me getting you three problems in one question. All right, so 17 was find the derivative at the given value. 18, 19 is going to be a little bit of a rewrite as well. Oh, look at number 21. Now, I didn't assign this, but this is part of my fun list. This one says, for each problem, find the slope of the function at the given value. Mm -hmm. It's the exact same thing. It's just different, it's just different words. The slope of the function is given to you by the derivative. derivative. And if we want to find it, the slope at x equals 0, then find the derivative and plug in 0. 
So I really just was wanting you to become familiar with the different terminology, different ways of asking the same, same question. I don't see anything, Steve. All right, and then we get this, I think this is one of the last sets. For each problem, find the equation of the tangent line for the function at the given point. Your answer should be in slope intercept form. Would you all want to walk through one of these real quick? I think you should do this just for fun. So they, uh, here's the function, y equals x cubed minus x squared plus four at one, four. Uh, do you all know what a cubic looks like? Sort of like a, sort of something like that, kind of what I would do the same, yeah, all right. And fun fact, this is actually just pretty much like a pure cubic. You get more, you know, accentuated middle stuff depending on the interplay that you get with these middle terms, uh, with like the x squared and linear terms. So sometimes it can look like, it can look like that if you have like a larger x squared term. It just affects that middle stuff. Anyway, this says one four. Uh, if I were to guess, I'd guess that's probably somewhere here. We probably have some sort of positive slope there. That probably would be good for me. I mean, if we want to see we can graph on the graphing calculator, but it's maybe something like that. Huh? Oops. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. If we get a weird answer, then we'll double check it with the calculator. Okay. Um, so, let's find the derivative. Uh, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm just saying find the derivative because that's what we've been doing the whole time. Well, uh, find the derivative to find the slope, and if you use the slope, the derivative point is step one. That's correct. So step one is going to be find the, uh, do the derivative so we can find the slope right there. So uh, dy over dx equals 3x squared minus 2x plus 0, so just like that. Um, dy over dx, ev uh, that bar right there means evaluated at, evaluated at x equals 1. So square need all sorts of different notation here. So it's going to be 3 times 1 squared minus 2 times 1, so 3 minus 2. So it looks like the slope is 1. And that's the slope of the tangent line. The slope of the tangent line is equal to 1. What Gracie said is we use the point slope form, y minus y1 equals m parentheses x minus x1 to build our equation. And that's what we'll do right here, where our x1, y1 are the coordinates of the point in question, 1, 4. So y minus 4 equals the slope is the slope at that point, which we found using the derivative. So 1 times x minus 1. So then we distribute the 1 and uh, add 4 to both sides to get y equals x, uh, so this is minus 1 plus 4, so x plus 3. Any questions? All right. Uh, go ahead and grab a calculator. I'd like to show you an amazing thing. Uh, this particular question is great. It's you know whatever. y equals x cubed minus x squared plus four, uh, what I said is we want to find dy over dx evaluated at x equals uh, one. I'm going to change that to let's say, what if, say I want to find the, the derivative at x equals five. What you can do is, um, let's put in parentheses, x cubed minus x squared plus four. Anyways, um, your calculator can do this. Your calculator can find what is called the numerical derivative. The numerical derivative is uh, 
the derivative evaluated at an x value. So essentially what the calculator can do is take the derivative and then plug in a point. Let me say that again. Your calculator can take the derivative and then plug in an x value and it will spit out a y, uh, spit out the slope value. Okay? Um, now you might ask yourself, ooh, can we get the calculator just to spit out the derivative? Can we get the can we just plug in x cubed minus x squared plus four and say calculator, find the derivative? And it gives us 3x squared minus 2x? And the answer is no. Not these calculators. Um, in order for you to do the, the so the algebraic derivative, your calculator has to have something called a computer algebra system. And there are calculators out there that can do that. Okay? Um, and there's also some software available on the web that can do it, like Wolfram Alpha can do it. Okay? That's free and available for you to use. It can calculate the, the derivative not at a point, just like the I don't even know the technical term, the non-numerical derivative, okay? Now you might ask yourself, well, if the calculator can't do this, how can it figure this out? Ivan, any ideas? Does it just substitute at the same time? It can't just substitute because it doesn't know. Like, I mean, there, it can't go from here to here. Does it go the long way? Like, yep. Mm. What it does is it, is it substitutes, since we're saying I want to evaluate at x equals one, it does the limit of the difference quotient. It says, what's the slope at uh, 1 1.1, 1.01, 1.001, 1.01, and, it, and then it uh, uses a limit limiting the limiting process to figure that out. And that's how the, so um, it literally puts it inside a for loop and says run <laughs> until we get to a point where our error is less than zero or our error is less than some tolerance. As a result, sometimes when you do this, you get weird answers. Like you might get 1.0003, I mean, because it's not, doing this exact algebraic process and then evaluating it, it's doing an approximation based on turning the crank on the, the slope of the secant line, okay? Um, a computer algebra system will, 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 hand, will do this properly. It's, and how do they do that? Um, maybe they just say, they grab this number and put it here and they drop it, they, they, they program a bunch of rules. I don't know, it, uh, that'd be something to be kind of fun to learn how, how the computer algebra system works. But imagine it's probably something like that. A bunch of if statements, if it's this type of thing, do that, so on and so forth. So anyway, um, have you all ever done that with the calculator, the numerical derivative? Let's do that. Uh, hit that math button on your calculator. And uh, go all the way down to N deriv, stands for numerical derivative. I kind of got this mixed up a little bit. Oh. The evaluate bar is over here. I said, let's figure out x equals five, I guess. So make sure you put a little x under the derivative over dx, so it looks like I put the blue idea. So anyway, x cubed minus x plus four evaluated at x equals five. What do y'all get? Which calculator tell you? 65.0001. Mm, okay. Lies, lies my calculator told me. Uh, so the calculator says it's 65 point, and I've got five zeros and then a one. Mm -hmm. That's because of what we were mentioning a second ago, the numerical long way of doing it. If we do it by hand, we get 3x squared minus 2x. Let's plug in 5. 
3 times 5 squared minus 2 times 5. So 5 squared is 25 times 3 is 75. 75 minus 10 is 65. So what's the correct answer? 65 or 65.00001? 65. 65. Yeah, that's the right answer. The calculator is a tool. And it's, but the tool has limitations, you know. So, um, you get a better tool, you can get something a little more accurate. But this, this is the correct answer. It's just sort of like if you were, I don't know, using a camera to capture a moment. Okay, it's gonna be there's gonna be limitations on that. And there's nothing that's gonna be able to really replace your brain and, your, and what you are able to see. Okay. All right. So that's uh, that's some good things there. We can so. That's a great tool. Numerical derivative, use your math button. Make sure you do that. I don't feel like we need to do any more of this, but that's a great tool that you can use to check your work, right? On, uh, say, problems like that, <laughs> where you're going to find the slope at the given value, right? I mean, technically, you could literally just plug that in and then plug in zero on your calculator. Boom, you're going to get the answer. But I want you all to do the one step of finding the derivative and then mm -hmm. and then evaluating at that point. You, uh, it's a, the great thing is you can just do that. Uh, also, limitation is that your calculator can only find the first derivative and evaluate it at a point. Mm -hmm. So if you want if you want some more stuff, then whatever. Uh, computer algebra system type calculators um, are pretty neat. Whether or not you get to use one in college is kind of based on the college and the professor and the course and stuff like that. So you end up taking Calc 2, maybe having a computer algebra system on your calculator would be kind of helpful, you know? But it might not be allowed on the test. So you gotta kinda, um, I, uh, we have a couple calculators that have that system. Uh, I've got them in my closet there, but because at one point we ordered some, but for the most part, the CAS, I'm not in that business of, I mean, you can, you can type in, you can type in the Wolfram Alpha or something like that, but no, it's blocked. Um, you got the rest of your life to, to use the computers to do that kind of stuff. Right now, I wanna make sure that you know how to, you know how to do this process. Because fundamentally, um, and I ran into this in college, um, there were students, peers of mine, that could type in stuff in the calculator all day long, but, they were handicapped based on that. They were totally reliant on the calculator. They, they never just took a few minutes to learn the long process. As a result, they couldn't check their work and they were arguing with me all day long that it was 65.0001. And I'm like, that's not it, it's 65, exactly. And they, they, were, they were limited by that. So don't use your limiters, okay? Use tell the calculator to be boss. All right. Uh, are there any other questions on that particular homework? Okay, uh, there's a few different things I want to get to, but the, one of the most important things is talk about the derivative of sine and cosine. So uh, let's go get out some notes. Uh, right now, we know how to take the derivative of pretty much any polynomial function. So like x to this power plus or minus x to this power plus or minus x to this power, so on and so forth. Um, what I want to talk about is how to take uh, the derivative of sine and cosine, okay? Um, there are a couple different ways that you can do that. The book uh, is going to show the squeeze theorem way, okay? Where for the, um, well, the squeeze theorem is, is, is for limits and stuff like that. And I guess they use it for, for sine and cosine as well. You know, uh, they tell you, oh, there's another function which is always bigger than sine, and always another function which is always smaller than sine, and so we can take the, you know, if we can take the limit of the one that's always above it and the limit of the one that's always below it, then we can find the limit and do the derivative of the sine function, blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's a highly algebraic way, and in my experience, doesn't really mean a whole lot to students. However, um, the way that I am gonna show you does mean a whole lot to students. Let me make this a little bit larger. So on your paper, go ahead and draw a rather large uh, sine graph here. So 
f of x equals sine of x. And what we're going to do is we're just going to do some local linearization techniques um, and come up with an estimate of what we think the uh, the cosine or the not the cosine the derivative looks like. And then we're going to plot it down here. So this is f prime of x equals I don't know. So we're going to pretend like we don't know. You remember to take your math semester? Maybe. Don't say it out loud. Don't say it out loud. Don't say it out loud. Okay. Spoil the surprise. Okay. So let's go ahead and draw some, some dots here and figure out uh, what's what. Uh, we talked about this a few minutes ago. Uh, at the peak, the tangent line looks horizontal, right? And down here at the trough, the tangent line also horizontal. So if I were to write down what those slopes were, what would those slope values be? Zero. Zero. I remember I had uh, right the last week what you and Harley said. Some of the, the comments were like, like your reflections on that were like gold. Like that was super big. And one or two of you said, "Well, I realize that it's not the y value." I think it was Harley said, "It's not the y value. It's the slope that we're looking at." And I'm like, "Yeah, that's perfect." Because so looking at that, we have a slope of zero. I'm going to make that zero the y value down here. Let's make sure the line comes up. So the derivative. We'll go ahead and do some local linearization over here. Uh, what do y'all think, class? Positive, negative, or zero? Positive. Positive. All right. Who's going to have the highest positive value? Yeah, this one. Okay. Uh, this is kind of like about a 1, and this is like a 0.7, and then like a 0.5, and then like maybe a 0.3. Okay. I'll just tell you that it's around 1 right here. So like a 1, and a 0.7, a 0.5, and a 0.3. If you look at this, this region right here, all the way from that, from the peak to the trough, uh, what sort of slopes are we having here? Negative. All negative. Yeah. But it's kind of interesting. We start off at zero, so this might be like a negative 0.1, and then we see that it's getting steeper. It's like negative 0.5, negative 0.7, negative 0.9. It gets really steep right here. Okay, in fact, it actually hits negative one. But then it starts getting shallower eventually. Here we have like negative 0.5, negative 0.3, because it goes back down to zero. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we have like, so we hit negative one right here. And then we start making our way back up to zero. And then, anybody, what sort of slopes do we have during this last region over here? Positive. Positive, getting steeper, right? 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 0 0.8, 1. All right. Now, what does that graph remind you of? Cosine. 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 And in fact, the derivative of sine is cosine. So if f of x equals sine x, then f prime of x equals cosine x. All right, let's go ahead and do that again now for cosine. Yes? Why are you doing that? Wait, are you just using decimals as an example? Or do you have to use decimals? Um, I know these these tangent values, okay. and they actually are. Now I don't know if, if I labeled them correctly, but I do know that the that the derivative of sine at zero is one. Okay. Okay. Um, so I I know what those values. So I mean, when we were kind of throwing numbers out earlier, we were like we might say like this is ten and this is seven and this is five and this is. 
Like, we were using that mostly for relatives. I actually happen to know what these, what these values are, which is why I put them there. Okay. Um, so yeah, and so what happens is, is that our slope values oscillate between negative one and positive one, which is, once again, exactly the range on the cosine function. Okay? So, derivative sine is cosine. Remember it, that's gonna be one of the things you'll need to have, to have memorized. Now, what about if I have a cosine graph? So f of x equals cosine x. You might think, based on what we just saw, that the derivative of cosine is sine. sine. Maybe we're right. Maybe we're not right. We'll find out together. So cosine, if you remember, starts off high, ends high, and in the middle it's got its low point. In the first quarter it cross crosses the x-axis, and the third quarter crosses the x-axis. I kind of draw a little bit of a curve kind of with what's going on. And a good place to uh, start when doing this sort of stuff is always at the peaks and troughs because those are values of zero slope for the tangent line. So zero here, zero here, zero here. I'll uh, go ahead and plot those points right now. So I'm plotting those slopes as the y value here. And then we have once again, this sort of falling action. So this tangent line, uh, this is going to be like negative 0.1, negative 0.5, negative 0.8. Uh, right here, when we cross the x-axis, it's negative 1. And then we have negative 0.8, negative 0.5, negative 0.1. So it starts off at 0. It looks like this point is going will hit negative 1. very good. That does not look very much like a sine graph. Let's draw some tangent lines here. Uh, how would y'all describe these tangent lines? Positive. Positive. Right here we're around zero and it's not very steep. So it's like 0.1, then 0.5, then 0.8. This looks pretty much, this is the place where it's the steepest. So it's one, but then it starts getting less steep going back towards zero on the slope. So like 0 0.8, 0 0.5, 0 0.1. So if I plot those values as like 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 0 0.8, up to one, and then 0 0.8, 0 0.5, 0 0.1, back down to zero. It is negative sine. It is negative sine, that is correct. So derivative of cosine is negative sine. Now we remember, why is it, why is it it's sine? Oh, the frustration of calculus one students everywhere. Because it isn't. Now, we actually did this analysis when it comes to motion in physics last year because we found, if you remember, when you have a spring going up and down, there's a relationship between position, velocity, and acceleration. And uh, we'll get to that eventually, but it's in the calculus as well, it's kind of fun. So there you go, derivative of sine is cosine, derivative of cosine is? Negative, negative sine. sine. Okay, now, uh, you might say, well, what is the derivative of tangent? And I say, well, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Okay, uh, before we talk about tangent, um, we need to talk about the product rule and the quotient rule, okay? Uh, because the way we figure out tangent is by applying the quotient rule. So, sine and cosine, check. Uh, next, there is something that we do not know how to do. And this is what, um, one 
something that's actually like a function. One of those you know how to do, one of those you do not know how to do. James, which one do you know how to do? Yeah, because we can apply the, the sum and difference property, right? That is the derivative of two functions added together is equal to the derivative of the first function plus the derivative of the second function. Okay. What we do not currently have is a um, a rule for when there's a product of two functions, okay? And you might think, I think I know what it is. I'm pretty sure it would follow the same pattern there. It would be the derivative of the first, so one times the derivative of the second. Unfortunately, it is not, okay? Um, and I could, I, we could, we could look at it. and I could show it to you, but it's, it's not. Um, if we were to, if we were to plug in values here and look at the slope, it's, uh, it's not cosine. Um, it's something, it's, it's something different entirely. Okay, uh, so that they're just doing the simple same process for sum and difference does not apply to products. Okay, uh, the, the way that we figure out the product is slightly different. So give yourself maybe a whole page or maybe half a page. Let's see if we can uh, knock this out here real quick. So for product, so the, what we're going to figure out is what is the derivative of some function times another function? We're going to uh, create a formula, it's called the product rule, for two functions being multiplied together. So here we go. So the derivative, by definition, is the limit of the difference quotient. So that limit is delta x approaches zero of f of x plus delta x times e of x plus delta x minus f of x g of x all over delta x. So um, what I'm going to do is for no apparent reason, I'm going to add and subtract something in the middle here. I'm going to say limit delta x approaches zero. Keep this first part, f of x plus delta x times g of x plus delta x. And then completely unmotivated, I'm going to put plus f of x plus delta x times g of x. Um, actually, I'm gonna put, I said plus, I meant minus. So minus, and then plus f of x plus delta x times g of x minus f of x g of x. Now, I don't know who thought of this idea, but they're pretty smart. I also might have had a lot of free time because like, they just arbitrarily chose to add and subtract the same thing <laughs> on the inside. Notice that's not gonna change the value. Essentially, we're just like, add, it's like subtracting five and adding five in the middle, okay? But um, if we split things up a little bit, we get some interesting uh, things going on. Notice, uh, this term right here, I've got an f of x plus delta x, and I have an f of x plus delta x right there. Um, what I can do is I can factor that out. So I can say f of x plus delta x times the quantity g of x plus delta x minus g of x. And over here, I have a g of x 
in both of those terms. So I can say plus g of x times f of x plus delta x minus f of x. questions so far? The next thing I can do, I can actually split this thing up. I can say, uh, I can write this one big fraction as two fractions added together. I can say the limit of delta x approaches zero of f of x plus delta x times g of x plus delta x minus g of x all over delta x plus g of x times f of x plus delta x minus f of x all over delta x. So I want you all to see, I've, I've essentially just taken this one fraction and split up into two fractions that both have the same denominator. All of this over delta x plus all of this over delta x. So far so good? Mm -hmm. What we'll do tomorrow is we'll finish this out, boom, 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 with like just another three lines, and we'll end up with a real nice formula called the product rule, which is going to tell us how we can solve derivatives like this. Okay? And then we'll learn something else called the quotient rule. And then those two things together are going to be extremely powerful and open up a whole new world of functions we can do.